Good morning, everybody, and uh, can I thank uh, Grant for the invitation to speak today? And I'm going to confess to being the one with the Vulcan salute, which I think is a really appropriate uh, uh, way to deal with uh, uh, the current situation. I'd like to thank Liam and Robert uh, from the Cairngorms Youth Action Group for setting out so clearly why climate change matters so much to young people and why we need to rise to the challenge. Uh, we know that there's a, a, a lot at stake for the younger generation. The Scottish Government is absolutely determined to end Scotland's contribution to the problem of climate change within a generation. Um, and uh, while some of us in the room might not live to see that, um, I'm sure that uh, Bob and Liam will. And um, I hope they will think back to when that, when that really began to take hold. It's good to see that Chris Stark, the Chief Executive of the Committee on Climate Change, is also here. We are exploring ways to bring the committee's world-class expertise to a new office here in Scotland, which would be absolutely uh, great news for us all. Last year, we listened to the voices of young people and the experts, and we declared a global climate emergency. Scotland's local authorities, led by COSLA, have also recognised what is in fact a twin climate and biodiversity crisis, and many of Scotland's councils have also declared a climate emergency. So thank you for taking time to be involved in the conversation and aren't we lucky to be able to have that conversation here in the beautiful Cairngorms National Park. And speaking of the surrounding beauty, the very first independent report that the CCC published in 2016 on the impacts of climate change in Scotland stressed that as well as our young people's futures, the very things that are iconic about Scotland are most at risk from climate change. Our natural heritage, our landscapes, our nature-based industries such as whisky and timber production. But climate change, of course, is already impacting Scotland. The Scottish Government published its new outcomes-based climate change adaptation programme in September last year, and I think I'm right in saying that Chris has praised the way the new programme was set out. Scotland, like the rest of the world, is already one degree Celsius warmer than pre-industrial times. And the effects of climate change are already with us and will intensify. Here in the Cairngorms, we've seen the River Spey at both very high and very low levels in recent years. There are concerns over the future of mountain habitats and wildlife, and concerns over the increasing risks of wildfires. We know that we have lived with increased flooding risk over a number of years. And I'd like to set out the national perspective on climate change. Scotland was one of the first nations to industrialise. But we've also got a long history of leadership on climate action. Our sticky fingerprints might be all over the emissions uh, of CO2. Uh, but since 1990, we've almost halved those emissions while continuing to grow the economy, increasing employment, and productivity. Scotland's new landmark Climate Change Act passed last year is the toughest, most ambitious legislative framework in the world and that's important because that ties us legally into the targets that we set. These are not aspirational targets, these are legal targets by which we have to um, assess our progress. The CCC advises that our target of net zero emissions of all greenhouse gases by 2045, five years ahead of the UK, is the limit of what can currently be achieved for Scotland. And achieving these goals does not sit with any one organisation or individual. We all have a part to play. Our response has got to be truly a national endeavour. We have created jobs and we've backed innovative new industries while preserving our natural assets. Last year alone, we planted a staggering 22 million trees, beating our target to create 10,000 hectares of woodland. What we have achieved has partly been because of our rich natural capital, coupled with environmentally responsible policy making, particularly in support for renewable energy generation. So three quarters of our electricity now comes from renewable sources. And recent figures show that Scotland's forests absorb the equivalent of 9.5 million tonnes of carbon dioxide in 2017 alone. In the decades since the first Scottish Climate Change Act uh, in 2009, 
we have earned international respect for our ambition and leadership on climate change, and over the past year we have stepped up the pace. And I can tell you, um, as, a, as somebody who goes about, uh, I've been at COPs over a number of years, goes to international conferences, um, when we tell them that we have halved our emissions by almost, by that halving uh, over the period since 1990, which is when everybody has to measure uh, their progress, um, they gasp. Because most countries are not achieving that. Most countries are not setting that target for themselves. Most countries aren't and haven't been able to do what we have done. But we've got to step up that pace. And across our economy, we are going to need to make sure that we deliver the innovation, the investment, regulation, market environment that will enable a step change towards net zero. So to meet our decarbonisation goals for a secure and stable electricity grid, we will need to support emerging technologies such as floating offshore wind, marine renewables and bioenergy with carbon capture and storage. In parallel, millions of acres of healthy peatlands and woodlands will act as carbon sinks while delivering co-benefits such as improved water quality and biodiversity. And as we realise our vision for 2045, we will enjoy carbon-free rail journeys and be able to charge our electric vehicles swiftly and conveniently. Our green circular economy will mean that the products we buy are made responsibly and made to last, while the food we enjoy is locally and sustainably produced. And meanwhile, our homes will be heated by affordable emission-free heating systems and smart devices will assist us to manage our consumption effortless, effortlessly. So these are just a few examples of how our lives will have to change and will change. However, while infrastructure and technological advances will clearly be crucial in the transition to net zero, progress does depend on people. It will be the people of Scotland who benefit from jobs in the net zero economy and establish our nation as a centre of international excellence as we drive the skills and innovation that will underpin our transition. Communities will play and already are playing a fundamental role in Scotland's response to the global climate emergency. We want to make our cities, towns and communities better, healthier places to live and to live in better harmony with nature. And a lot of the changes required to hit our climate change targets will actually enable that. I want to talk a little bit about what we've done since the First Minister declared a global climate emergency last April. We set climate change at the heart of our government programme, setting a vision for a Green New Deal for Scotland and announcing ambitious new policies in the programme for government and budget, including introducing the Scottish National Investment Bank with a primary mission to secure the transition to net zero, supported by £130 million in the coming year, bringing to market over the next three years a £3 billion portfolio of low-carbon projects including renewables, waste and construction plans to invest over half a billion pounds in improved bus infrastructure, plans to decarbonise railways by 2035 and create the world's first zero-emissions aviation region in partnership with Highlands and Islands Airports Limited. So there's quite a lot going on and will be going on over the next few years. And the budget earlier this month announced a significant package for climate change, including over that a half a billion pounds allocated to the Agricultural Transformation Fund and new funding for green growth accelerator projects. We're also expanding funding for zero emission cities and for energy efficiency and fuel poverty programs, and that's really important because that's part of how we need to think and balance what we're doing. I've mentioned our exceptional natural assets, so we will invest almost £57 million pounds for woodland grant funding for this year alone, and the massive uplift to spend on peatland restoration will be a game changer. A quarter of a billion pounds over 10 years will bring significant emissions reductions, huge biodiversity benefits, and be an enormous boost to the rural economy. And I could make this entire speech about that alone, and I do intend to make some entire speeches about peatland restoration over the next few months and the year. All of this, alongside the announcement of £2 billion of new additional infrastructure investment over the next Parliament, is evidence of our commitment to swift and decisive action on climate change. We are expanding schemes that work, developing new ones, and responding to expert opinion. And the Committee on Climate Change estimates that less than 40% of the required changes will be achieved through low-carbon technologies or fuels alone. 
most of the action needed to meet the net zero target will require some behavioural or societal changes. Individuals and communities must be supported and empowered to take action as part of a ground-up approach to tackling climate change. And that, of course, is what Bob and Liam were talking about. So within the Climate Challenge Fund, which has invested over £100 million in community-led climate projects over the past 11 years, I've committed to establishing a network of community climate action hubs and climate action towns. And these hubs and towns will help ensure that community action is joined up and takes account of local circumstances. We know that community action can be a powerful driver of more widespread behaviour change through, for example, normalising walking and cycling as a means of travel, something we see all around the National Park, and simply by raising awareness of climate change and getting people talking about it as we are today, what we'd call promoting climate literacy, although we maybe don't use that jargon um, outside. Um, but that's the kind of way we get that message spread around. The update to the climate change plan in April will build on everything we've heard through the big climate conversation informed by advice from the Just Transition Commission and the Committee on Climate Change. In 2019, you spoke to us, over 2,500 people participated in the big climate conversation in communities across Scotland from Shetland to Dumfries. I heard from businesses at our Mission Zero Summit and at our Business in the Parliament event where discussions focused on how businesses can be leaders in the transition and over 200 public sector organisations responded to a consultation on the transition to net zero and of course that includes the National Park. Public participants called for improvements to public transport and active travel infrastructure, clear diet guidance, a cultural shift to the adoption of a circular economy in Scotland, financial support for home energy improvements and increased education and awareness about climate change. And there was a strong desire for actions to be taken forward as part of an integrated plan. Additionally, there was support for the Scottish Government leading the way and showing leadership, as well as setting an example for the types of actions and behaviours people should be adopting. Public and stakeholder engagement will continue beyond the update to the climate change plan. Each of these things simply becomes a stage along the way. We are updating our public engagement strategy in line with our ambition, and the Citizens' Assembly will play an important role in forming policy development and delivery. As I said earlier, we need a long-term strategic approach to delivering the transition to net zero to ensure that we can capture the economic and social opportunities and manage the risks and ensure a just transition this is our commitment to a Green New Deal for Scotland and we remain the only country in the world to have set up a Just Transition Commission. Again, we are leading by example. The actions needed to become net zero by 2045 will transform all sectors of our economy and society and as the pace of our transition increases, the need to ensure that our transition is just becomes ever more important. A just transition is one that creates jobs through new sustainable industries, is good for communities and helps tackle inequalities and poverty. The Scottish Government has taken world leading action by embedding those just transition principles in our climate change legislation. We've also established an independent commission to provide advice on how to do this. The Commission published its interim report last month and we will be considering the interim advice carefully as we prepare the climate change plan updates which will be laid in Parliament by the end of April. Net zero for 2045 represents a step change in ambition for Scotland. Equally, as the Committee on Climate Change recognised last year, we can't do this alone. The UK Government must step up and match Scottish policy ambition in areas where key powers are reserved. They need us to get there by 2045 if they're going to get there by 2050, but we need them to plan and implement for getting there by 2050 if we're going to get there by 2045. We are locked together in this endeavour. In the spirit of working together across different perspectives and different sectors, I'm chairing a working group to support ambitious new emissions targets and members of the Scottish Parliament, academics, industry and environmental organisations are discussing options and priorities in an entirely new approach to updating Scotland's climate change plan. So we need to change the way we do things now. Like later this year, the Climate Citizens Assembly for Scotland will meet, and the Assembly will play an important role 
in informing decision making as we consider the far reaching changes across society that will be required to meet our ambitious targets. And that's about trying to pull ordinary people into this conversation effectively. In November this year, of course, we will welcome tens of thousands of people to Glasgow to discuss global action on climate change at COP26. This is the most important climate conference since Paris in 2015, and indeed might prove to be the most important in living memory. It must raise global ambition and action and ensure that as the world transitions to a net zero future, it is done in a way that is fair and just. We cannot leave anyone behind. <coughs> and although there are some details that we need to clarify with the UK government, such as how they wish to utilise the Glasgow Science Centre during COP, we are confident that these issues can be resolved. I also appreciate that some people may be concerned about the impact of COVID-19 on COP26 and I want to reassure those people that while we continue to plan for a successful COP, all of our decisions in relation to this virus will be strongly underpinned by scientific advice. Through COP26, Scotland will further harness the will and ambition of the Scottish Government and the Scottish people, firmly positioning Scotland as a world leader in tackling climate change. We encourage all partners to seize the opportunity of COP26 to show the best of what Scotland has to offer. And again, I say, Scotland and Glasgow helped to lead the world into the industrial age. We now have an obligation and an opportunity to lead the world into the zero emissions age. The Scottish Government is working closely with all public bodies and the wider public sector to strengthen our action on climate change. And I know that the Cairngorms National Park has over 15 years of experience of coordinating a wide range of public, private and community bodies to work to weather, uh, together toward collective achievements. The Authorities Board has made climate change a priority for over a decade and I warmly welcome this clear commitment. And the next partnership plan will be key to setting out the approach for the future. This park is indeed a key place to show the transition to a net zero society, especially around land use change and the transition to a low carbon tourism destination. I understand the park has around 1.9 million people visits every year and how people travel to the park will have to change. There has already been significant active travel investment in the park in recent years. Um, the Speyside Way extension opening in April 2020 connecting Aviemore to Canusi was really important and there's a significant increase in bike and e-bike usage. Um, I, I know that that's uh, already happening. Ensuring that in the future that you have the right facilities such as electric vehicle charging points and bike charging points is really important, especially given um, you've got an area with a small resident population but a massive annual visitor population. So managing that infrastructure will be um, tricky. I was struck by the huge range of initiatives going on in the park that contribute to our climate change, sustainability and biodiversity objectives, woodland creation, peatland action, catchment partnerships on the Spain D, health walking groups and health partnerships, the Nature Action Plan on Biodiversity, the Cairngorms Capacale Project, and Landscape Scale Partnerships of Cairngorms Connect and the East Cairngorms Moorland Partnership, which are looking to achieve significant biodiversity and climate objectives. And that's an impressive range of actions. And the Park Authority is cutting emissions from its operations and has started the process of moving fleet vehicles from diesel to hybrid and pure electric. And I understand the Park team is going to look to establish a date for uh, z net zero, uh, sorry, zero. So we have to be careful here because zero direct emissions, not the same as net zero. So they're looking for zero direct emissions from their own operations. And I think and hope that they'll be able to uh, make clear what that day is by the end of uh, this year. Again, that's welcome leadership. Park has also been a strong supporter of Scotland's annual climate week. Um, I've said this is not just for governments to solve, we need it to be a national endeavour, we've got to get everybody on board. Climate Week has historically focused on the public sector, but this time, given the urgency of the challenge, we're trying to expand our audience uh, to include organisations from all sectors of Scottish society. Climate Week last year was a resounding success, it was a, particip a participation from a huge range of organisations, and I was pleased to see so many schools taking part. So I'm happy to announce that Climate Week 2020 will run between Monday 14th and Sunday 20th September. Um, I should see you all putting those dates into your diary right now um, so that you can all be involved in that. Plenty of time to plan. So this year we celebrate Climate Week's fifth anniversary and of course it's going to act as a key springboard into COP26. We will again be encouraging all organisations across Scotland to take part. 
I will be encouraged to engage that staff, perhaps more importantly the public, on climate change. And here in this room, we know how important that action is, but not everyone's aware of those challenges. We have a responsibility to talk about climate change, to take the message out there and encourage people to take action now. Climate Week is just one way that we can do this um, and it would be good to hear your plans. I know that after you're invited speakers today you've got workshops on various themes. I hope you'll gather from everyone here various opportunities, actions and ideas to take forward. I encourage everyone to actively participate in expressing their views even if they're a little bit critical, even if they're asking questions, um, uh, challenging assumptions, that, that's an important part of all the conversations that we have about this. I look forward to hearing uh, the outcomes by working with all the communities in the park, as you have done for so many years previously. I'm pretty sure you will be able to rise to the challenges. Uh, through tackling the climate emergency and ensuring we have a healthy and thriving environment, um, we will improve Scotland's collective well-being, people and nation, and achieve our national and indeed international aims of tackling the twin emergencies, climate and biodiversity. These are both crises, but we can tackle them together. And we want to absolutely ensure that we can pass on a secure future to the younger generation, so that in a couple of decades' time, Bob and Liam are standing here, perhaps in different capacities, being able to look back on the enormous progress that was actually made from when they were young people, and that we have not let them down, and that we do not let them down. Thank you.